Good, good morning. How are y'all doing today? This conference has been a very, uh, or this summit has been a very um, experience. It's been experience been very fascinating for me. In fact, this morning I just put something together. Way back in the day, about 21 years ago, I had a chance to participate in a science competition, and I worked for years with my brother on this little experiment with a volcano. And as I walked into the school, I truly realized I was never going to win because there was some kid in front of me with buckets of water. <laughs> so now I understand why I lost. <laughs> so with all sincerity, I, I feel thrilled to be here. I can't, I can't be more excited about sharing what, what we as a team in Salt Lake City have created for the students of this city and hopefully for the students of this world. Um, I wanted to kind of do a review a little bit. In this conference, we learned how to pop, right? I was thrilled because I found out yesterday I have rhythm. <laughs> I also learned that it's important to speak from the heart. Ben, as you know, gave us a gift from the heart as he talked about his skills in dancing. We also learned, as we have always been talking about, the classrooms of today unfortunately look a lot like the classrooms of a thousand years ago. We also know that teachers are the key. A lot of reform efforts and a lot of uh, chatter on the outside of public education tends to devalue the teacher, the value of the, the teacher's role in the classroom. Curtis could not hit it more on the head when he talked about the teacher-mentor relationship. Also, we know that relation, relationships, risk-taking, community, and responsibility are a key to our success in public education. I want to express to you that I think the number one key to us being successful as we move forward is also the idea of a mentor-teacher relationships. It's not about the teaching if you can't have a relationship with the teacher. So how do you design a structure that allows students to be able to access teachers? And more importantly, how do you free up the teacher so that they can access the students? Unfortunately, or sadly, I would say, most students are learning to be taught, but they're not taught to be learners. So... We need help. Our school systems need help. I'm not here to criticize. I'm just saying that we know we need help. We recognize that students are not succeeding at the levels we want. I can only speak from my experience in Salt Lake City. We have about 25,000 students, and we don't graduate them all. So let's fix it. How are we going to fix it? Another one of my epiphanies this week, of which I, I want to express, and I'm going to be real with you, is that I think we can fix it if we work together. So you've heard this word, ohana, family, correct? So I'm going to tell you why I'm even here on this stage today. And I don't mean to get emotional, but I think I put it all together last night. Um, in 1969, <clears throat> in 1968, 1967, uh, Jerry and Jean went over to uh, a small city in, or a small town in Hawaii. And this is why it all links together, this idea of family in Hawaii. And they went to, to educate some folks in, the Poly, in, in Hawaii, the Polynesian family. And as they were there, they grew to love it, and their family became more than just the two of them. Their family became two, then three, then four. And ultimately, the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian people embraced this wonderful family back in 1969. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I think it's important. Because if I can't be real with you, then what I'm going to deliver and share with you today does not mean as much. So Jerry and, <clears throat> Jerry and Jean came back from the islands after spending seven years there and truly had an experience with Ohana. At the time they came back, Jean was uh, carrying two little babies. She was pregnant with two twin boys. And it's very tender to me because it was at this time of year that she rolled over and talked to my father and said, I don't think one of these babies is going to make it. I think one of them has some problems. And he, of course, blew it off and said, don't worry, honey, you're just worried about the fact that we have twins coming and it's going to be twice as stressful. Well, <clears throat> never devalue or never underestimate what the power of emotion is and what the power of insight of a woman because my mother was absolutely correct that one of the people involved in this 
beautiful gift of life would not make it. Unfortunately, she was wrong. On who? And so the reason it's so tender for me, and the reason I think it's important for this presentation, is that just 43 years ago, we celebrated man landing on the moon you know, on the 21st of July. Seven days prior, my mother gave birth to two um, red-headed, snot-nosed kids. But on the 21st of July, as those men landed on the moon, she joined them in the heavens. And I tell you that, not for the emotional component, because we all have life stories. But I go to the next word, which you've heard a lot of, and which I've now tied together, kuleana. I feel it as my life's role and job, responsibility, if you will, to give back that life which I have been so, so gratefully been given by a person who will never see the fruits. And I want to tell you that because my kuleana is what I'm going to share with you next. This is my responsibility, is to meet the needs of the students in this country, to meet the needs of the students in this city, and to take care of our sacred responsibility. The number one thing we don't do with students is we don't ask them about their high school experience. I had a chance to lead a, a very large school, 2,500 students here in the city, and as I realized, as I talked with the students, we weren't listening to them. The number one thing that we would say is, what would you say if you were to ask, really, 1,000 students or 2,000 students about their high school experience? Generally speaking, this is the number one response I would get. It's boring. Why is it boring? Because they're not engaged. Why do they get in trouble because they're messing with cell phones? Why are they getting in trouble because... They're not focused on the class because the classroom is not engaging. The environment is not what it should be. When you ask the students what do they want, they'll tell you. They'll tell you that they want a school. Or say, you should ask them, they'll tell you. So have we asked them? Well, we did. In Salt Lake City, we've sent out a bunch of, uh, of surveys and asked the students, what kind of school do you want? Now, of course, we dismissed the students who wanted to have six-hour lunches and wanted to have school only on Mondays and Fridays. But really what they said was, we want a school that is student-centered. It's fascinating to me. About a decade ago in our district, we had what was called a research-based um, effort to understand when do students engage in learning and when is the best time to start school. We've all been in those dialogues, perhaps, in your experience. And what we truly know is in the high school settings, students don't like to engage with their learning or don't even want to get up until 7.30 or 8. And in our system, we were teaching or we were starting our school at about 7.45. And after that year and a half of research and board meetings and parent input, we understood that school should start around 8.30 to 8.45 to make it ideal and have students get out later in the day. Do you know what happened in my district? And I love my district, but do you know what happened the following year? You want to guess? That's right, we started school five minutes earlier. So instead of being at 7.45, now we start at 7.40. So I don't know that we were listening to the student, but we were listening to the adults. Students also want schools to be extremely flexible. We've been talking about this uh, throughout the last couple of days. What does flexibility mean? They need flexibility and access to core. They need flexibility and access to their curriculum. They need flexibility and access to their teachers. And they need flexibility and access to their education. They need to be in control of this. Many of our students, as you know, particularly in my city, um, because of the economic status of many, they work or they come from single family homes or child or, or child care and responsibilities of home can become a challenge for their educational pr progression. But yet as a system, do we do anything to accommodate? And another thing the students want is they want it to be individualized. They need the schools to be individualized. So often in our high schools, they're so huge that they simply walk in the doors and I would argue that 10% walk out within two weeks, particularly our ninth grades coming in. So could you imagine with me if we had a school that would be totally different, that would take all of those things I mentioned and more and put it under one roof? I would challenge you in your environments, wherever you work, and whatever responsibilities you have, to try to do the same thing, to imagine what kind of a school you could make where students are at the center. Different from what Curtis talked about, where it's a student teacher, we put the student at the center of every decision we made. And it was a challenge. 
We created this school. It's called Innovations High School. I also want to just kind of throw out a slight joke there that I noticed they copied my school's name by calling this the Innovation Summit, but I want to let you know that <laughs> we claimed this school name a couple of years ago. Innovations High School is actually, for, for you, is only seven blocks down the street. So just seven blocks down on State Street, that's where the school is, tied in with the community college. This took us seven years of planning, so kudos to all of you who plan, because in seven years of planning, five years of dreaming, and then three years of really starting the implementation, I would say, generally speaking, we hit a big home run. What are the outcomes of the education that we rebuilt? Well, naturally speaking, first thing we said is school's got to be open longer. 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Students have access to their teachers. Another thing we did is we said class periods, that's a thing of the past. Why do we have class periods? That's ridiculous. And I'm not saying that to be offensive. I'm just saying, why do we have a class period? In our system, most systems in this, in this country, we do a four by four block, 90 minutes, 85 to 90 minutes. Do you think students aren't succeeding because of what they know and they don't know or by the structure we have created that makes it even a challenge to navigate? In fact, in our school system, it's very possible for a student to have math on a Thursday and not have math again until next Wednesday, depending on if there's a holiday on a Monday. And then we sit back as adults and scratch our heads and wonder why the outcomes on all the different types of assessments show our students not doing as well as we think they should, because we set up a system for them to fail. Students are engaged in learning at six hours a day in my school. And you say, wait a second, six hours a day? Most schools are set up for seven. No, the key word here is engaged. How many of our students are engaged in learning in your high school in a day? If you walk into a classroom, as I have walked into thousands, I would say sometimes a student might be engaged in an hour and a half class, two minutes a day, six minutes a day, 10 minutes. The, most, uh, the students who are truly engaged, truly they're engaged a lot longer, but a lot of our students are not engaged like we'd want them to be. We don't have any bells. There's no need for them. Bells are a system that puts in place to tell students to move around. We don't tell the students where to go. They tell them, they themselves figure out where they need to be. As was discussed yesterday, students are in control of time and they are in control of when they learn, not the teacher. And it's not because we don't value the teacher. It's because we want the student to be able to have that ownership, to truly be student-centered. More outcomes. Teachers are teaching. Teachers are engaged in our school eight hours a day. One of my teachers is here, and so is a number of our students, which you'll be able to visit with during the breakout session. I would argue that my teachers are teaching nine hours a day. They're superstars. They do it because they love it, because they can really engage with the student. And we'll talk more about that. Class sizes are 35% lower. If you do the math, you understand if you have a four by four block and the teacher has a prep every other day or every day, you're naturally gonna have larger class sizes. In this environment where a teacher is accessible and available for eight hours a day, where students can ebb and flow into their classroom, the class sizes, generally speaking, are never larger than 15 to 20. Teachers relinquish control of pacing and access to curriculum. Completely key. I don't want teachers spending all of their time building curriculum. Certainly we have great teachers out here in this country, and they can build phenomenal curriculum. Well, let's just use what they've built. Let's use what's been built by professionals that are tied into learning standards and are tied into assessments. I don't need my teachers spending all of their downtime grading a test. I want them to be able to use that time to engage with the student. And I have said, and it's a, a, slight, a little bit of a joke in my school, but I said, if there's a lecture in this school, you're not a teacher. I don't want to see a lecture in my school because a lecture means that I automatically have 50% of those students disengaged in the learning process. And in our school, we believe in direct one-to-one -one student and small group instruction. We have five quarters a year. What's summer? In Salt Lake City, I don't know if you've had a chance to explore, got on tracks and gone all the way down to the prison or out to the airport, but we don't have a lot of farms in this valley. No need to have summer off. So we said, forget summer. We started on June the 8th. June the 6th is when we graduated. Our, well, we, our, our eighth graders um, finished their, their middle school experience. On June, on June the 6th, they finished their middle school experience at Innovations High School. They started school on June the 8th, and they've been there every day and they love it. 
We want our students, by the time the rest of you guys in the country have started, our students should have one to two credits already under their belt before most students have even thought, what does ninth grade look like? We have a strong mentor-teacher program. In fact, it's the key to our success. We have a one-to-one -one student computer ratio. I can talk more about that in the breakout. Completely broke down a lot of myths, particularly when you're talking about students in poverty and students with limited access. This one was a stunner for me as to how much and how impactful this has been for our students and how easy it is to do. We've had significant academic progress and achievement. And we believe in comprehension. If you know the information, no need to continue to sit in that seat for another 46 hours as dictated by the Carnegie unit. Again, why? Why do we do this? Why do we do these things? It's legacy, like, like Curtis referred to. All 11th and 12th grade students, they must and are required to take college courses. We made a partnership with Salt Lake Community College, which is our higher ed partner here in the city. All of our 11th and 12th grade students, and some of them over here probably pulling their hair out because they know it's true, they must take college classes. We'll support them, but we expect them to be successful and jump into that. They also are expected to have industry certificates if they don't uh, pursue a college associate's degree. And then uh, we deliver courses in multiple formats, which what I would say is one is digital and the other one is in a bricks, traditional bricks and mortar class or format. And we've re-engaged the parents. Why? Because we've allowed the technology that's available in your pockets, that's available in their homes to actually truly work so that parents know what their students should be learning, they know where their students are, and they don't have to worry about it, and they can be engaged in the conversations with the teachers because they understand what their student is or is not doing. A powerful, powerful tool. So, what does our community say? Mind you, we've only been in business for 11 months. These are where our enrollments are. But unfortunately, this is the trend line of our requests. We cannot meet the demand. And I'm proud to say that. One of the local schools up on the hill called me. The principal said, Ken, we got a bunch of students that want to come down and enroll in innovations. I said, Paul, I don't have the space. I don't have the room. He says, well, what do we do? I said, why don't you put it in your school? What I want to tell you is what we built was, in essence, able to be scalable in every school in this country. Why? Because I wanted to be able to say my gift, my Juliana, was to be able to show that we as public educators can do this from the inside. We don't need external stimulus, generally speaking negative, to help us do things that we can do by ourselves if we just allow ourselves to create and think. So you're going to say next, ah. Oh, my slide. You're going to say, yeah, yeah, you can do this because in Salt Lake City, everybody's rich, right? <laughs> no, we're not. We have, in our school, in our school district, we are about 60% uh, poverty, and we are uh, uh, now a minority-majority school district. And within our school, 45% of our students are lower income, 35% are Latino, 5% African-American. I would say in that African-American group, we also are a refugee city, so we have Africans. And then we have Polynesian or Pacific Islanders. And what is even more powerful is 10% of our students are special ed students. Fascinating. The actual, the, the, the students that are succeeding the most in this dynamic and in this format are special ed students, more so than others, because they can get their personalized learning and they don't feel like they stick out. Think about a student that might have uh, dysgraphia, for example, or autism. Think about those kind of students in your classroom of 30 do they stick out? Sometimes, yes. In our school, you couldn't find them unless we're in our students, in our student meetings, in our large group meetings. You can't find them because they no longer, uh, their disability no longer is, is something you can see. Powerful. Our current wait list, unfortunately, is 150. Why do I say this? Why is this even important for you? Because I want to tell you, this will be the same thing that will happen in your community. So make 100% happen. I want to disagree slightly with this slogan. I know it's probably taken the marketing team thousands of dollars to generate this one. <laughs> but I also want to say, let's make 0% happen as well. So with any presentation like this, let's just say, I'm not going to say anything for a few seconds while I click through these slides and let you just read them. 
So really, let's make it happen both 100% and 0%. this last slide for all you naysayers to say you can't do it in your state. This slide, I, we usually don't brag about this, but we will today. We did this as the lowest funded state in the country. Now, anybody from Mississippi? We can always arm wrestle for who gets that last position, but generally speaking, it's between us and Mississippi. <laughs> and I want to say to you, zero excuses. So my kuleana to you, and my gift to you from my heart, just as Ben gave it to you in the form of dance and others, is I offer you zero excuses. Today in our breakout, if you want to hear more about how we did it, because it is a complex beast to, to, to put together, I brought our students, I brought hopefully a parent, and we have teachers here. And I'm telling you, our students are counting on us to do this. So I challenge you to go out and help me and help us all change the world.